yeah. I was an absolute wreck at 20. You know what yeah. I mean? It took me until 27, 28 before I even started to get a, a hold on things. I just got, I think I just got either, it, I don't know, luck, providence, you know, my, even my mother would say, she was like, I don't know how you do it. You just, you always land on your feet. You shouldn't, <laughs> you, you probably shouldn't be landing on your feet, but you always seem to, you're going to do something crazy. And then you always land on your feet, you know? Funny. And so, Call you but cat. I was definitely a mess, like a cat, like a cat. It's, and it seems to be carrying on. So God must love me. That's, that's all I can think that it Amen. is. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm going to ask, because it's been a while, and I know that we got some complaints, but I'm going to do it anyway, because I'm the host of the show. But what is your guys' favorite Batmobile, or depiction of the Batmobile, anyway? Mm. Yeah, think about that. You know, um, I mean, maybe just the time I grew up, I, I just... I know, I know, but the Adam West Batmobile was awesome. Oh, you know, oh, that's in my top three, without a doubt. It was yeah. awesome, you know. I really loved it, and um, it's still cool now. I mean, if, if I if you line them all up, it's such a standout one. You know what I mean? And it's just mm-hmm. like it's so good, um, iconic. I just, it's so iconic. So iconic. It's so yeah. iconic. it's like iconic in of itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. And who even remembers I, what the Batmobile looked like from Batman Forever? I have no idea, but like I'll always know the Adam West. That mobile oh how could Always. you know yeah but I, will, I will say this though you love the tumbler i love the tumbler man i mean the when the tumbler first came on screen or you first see it i remember just be like oh my goodness that's incredible so yeah the tumbler was cool i'm gonna go mike i'm gonna go the michael keaton the very very first one mm-hmm. and that's i think one. i think the reason for that is that it was just so like it was so surprising because it was the first time that the Batmobile on screen had been presented in kind of a non campy way. Mm -hmm. Like that it's like, this is what this machine would really look like were it to really be built. And I just remember the first time seeing it as a kid that my, this, the feeling that I got was just like, Ooh, this is like a real, this is a real thing that's good. That's happening right here. Like, Whoa, this is amazing. So I'm, I'm, just for the impact it had on me. I mean, there have been some other ones that were just amazing. No, but those, those, those are both awesome. I, I, yeah, I like that one. I like the original. Michael I mean, forgive me for jumping in. I'm just having fun with it. But I feel like that's the feeling I have with the Tumblr. Because, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it was just like, oh, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Because it's like a military. Mm-hmm. It's like a, a comped military vehicle. And like, I just... So I, that feeling was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a tank. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's, cool that's one of the best lines in that movie. It's like, it's a tank? Like a tank. The, the cop, you know, the cops yeah. are trying to drive it. And yeah. Like, that's good. That's cool. No, what about I, you, Andrew? Um, well, I don't dislike the Tumblr. I like the Tumblr quite a bit. Um, and without getting too into it, uh, I wasn't really crazy about a lot of the Nolan stuff. But the Tumblr worked. I thought the Tumblr definitely worked. I loved the idea of it being a decommissioned military vehicle. I thought that that was awesome. Um, I really love the 90s cartoon Batman. Just the, mm. the, the sleek back, just like the very, like, uh, I don't, I forget the word, I'm, the aesthetical look. I'm very, uh, I can't remember what the word it's is. It's like a noir. It's kind of like a noir. Noir, but there, I can't remember the stupid word for it is, but it's something 50s. It's, it's, I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Noir is a good word for it, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to say, like, man, this, the Pattinson one, this newest one is like... Oh, you like it, huh? Oh, man, did I like it. I liked, like, the reason I bring it up is because 
I don't know what happened, but something happened last week, and I started watching rewatching the Batman, just kind of having it on in the background. Something about that movie clicked, and I loved it the first time, but now it like took it to the next level. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this might be the best Batman movie ever made. Like, I, I you know, and that's my opinion, you know, it's okay if it's different, but like that first Cyprian, have you seen it? I haven't seen it yet. No. Okay. Well, there's a scene where you first see it in every. And I can't tell you, Cyprian, it's better than you think. I, I was, okay. Andrew will tell you, I was a naysayer. I was like, eh. Okay. I've been, yeah. I've been it, pumping this. I've been like, all right. I, I have it. not been excited about it. I will tell you that. I just oh, been I was like, anti. Eh. I was like, this, yeah. <laughs> Father was this movie's <laughs> alphabet soup. I don't, you know. <laughs> None of that really too much. Um, but, uh, there's some subtle stuff going on there, but that's neither here. The re- so I, I rewatched it. Probably that would be my third time watching it. And some stuff just really started to click for me. And I was like, it, it took it to the next level. And there's a scene where everybody knows what's happening. And like, he's getting ready to chase someone. And I won't really, mm-hmm. but, and you hear like the vroom. And I don't know if you've seen it, but it's essentially like a muscle car. I yeah, don't know no, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah I've, okay. I've seen the the stills and everything like, of it. Catwoman stops and like looks, and then Penguin stops and looks, and like some other people like stop and look, and you just know mm. what's going on. And then you see like like the lights turn on and all this stuff. And I like I saw it in theater, it was like vibrating in my chest, and like mm. I just showed it to um a couple other people not too long ago because it's a family in town they hadn't watched it and none of them were that excited for it including my sister who's not into superhero movies and she really liked it and i was like this is this is a, I, everyone got chills i could tell like, everyone was like their eyes were just like a gape just staring at the screen i was just like it's i don't know man it's such a good movie i'll have to it, sit down and watch it with my wife please we'll do we'll yeah and then you tell me what you think because okay. it's very like it's batman being a detective you see him walking around yeah, i like that i like that you're like a lot of batman movies his stillness and then you turn around turn back and he's gone mm-hmm. but no you see him like walking around like talking to people like interacting with things he's like being very much a detective and uh, the one thing i don't mind spoiling it uh because it's not really a spoiler but there's a part at the very beginning where they're investigating a murder and like all the cops like what do we do with this guy because he's like just walking around like messing with evidence and stuff and he like looks down at the floor and just like narrows his eyes and like walks away and then like someone comes behind him and like takes a picture behind it like so they're already Mm. like okay this dude's seeing some stuff we're not seeing but man man oh man that's a good interesting okay yeah, and I have a rewatch because my wife wants to rewatch it too. And I am, that would be number five for me seeing this movie. Oh my goodness. And I am like, I'm ready. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Like, it's a great movie. It okay. is, and the soundtrack is incredible. Incredible. All right. So, all right. Okay. All right. Get that out of the way. Seal of approval. Andrew's hey. seal of approval. We got it. I like Batman, guys. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I, and, this is truly if, i walked if, out if of they the movie. didn't know by now if the, yeah, if the viewers know. didn't know by now you don't know but uh it, i walked out of the movie a bigger fan of batman hmm. like i was like i love batman more now because there's something that's been touched on here that hasn't really been touched on but this isn't a batman podcast all this, as much as i wish it was it's not a batman podcast we're here because we're actually going to talk about the creed this week. So, all right. So we are now at, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. Mm-hmm. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. Mm-hmm. And so that's the end of the creed. We'll see how much that those finishing lines we can get through. But I think uh, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, I think is a good place to start. I think so. Because it gives us a little like time to talk about the sacraments a little bit, mm-hmm. um, which is something that people have been asking <clears throat> for um, to the degree to our limited fan base that we have asking about us to kind of maybe we can go through them in the because, OK, so we just took Holy Unction last night. We just received Holy Unction last night. Um, and so I thought, you know, with that in mind and with uh baptisms 
Yeah, and all yeah, all the all the sacraments basically to to see what kind of insights we could gleam from our priest Father Turbo, priest and spiritual father Father Turbo. So have at it, Father. Let's start. Let's start. Let's start. Okay. I mean, I can, if I can start very broad. Very broad. No problem. If I can start with this. Actually, I don't get holy unction. I love it. It's one of my favorite sacraments. Like I absolutely like first Wednesday of every month we do unction at St. Mary's. I, I try to be there every single time. I know it's that it's like incredibly important. I know the St. I know James. I know the, 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 uh, epistle father. Is that the correct word? Epistle of James. Yeah. Epistle of James that we read. I understand like that aspect of it. I, I don't understand like much else about it. So maybe father, if you wouldn't mind starting with unction and sure. you know, we can talk about that for a little bit. Sure. Well, uh, Holy Unction is a sacrament and um, it essentially is the, um, the continuation uh, and manifestation of the healing ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And in the sacrament of unction, <clears throat> um, typically it's... Um, so it's it's um, served um, at specific times. It's served um, often when someone is very ill, and um, it's usually served with like seven priests, oftentimes, um, or multiple priests, maybe you can get you know in that in that context. Um, and it'll be served um, during um, the depending on the parish, you know. Uh, this parish here and other parishes, the Wednesday of Holy Week, it'll be served. And it is a time in which the faithful um, are given, the healing ministry of our Lord is, is always available, always working. But Holy Unction in particular as a sacrament is a um, direct um, particular manifestation of that, of that aspect of our Lord's ministry. Um, it is um, essentially a, a quote-unquote true healing service in which um, oil and wine are blessed, and from there the faithful are anointed with it. Only Orthodox can get unction because uh, it is a sacrament, and um, typically speaking, the faithful are asked to fast. Uh, and if they can't confess before receiving holy unction. And it is there for the healing of both soul and body. And so um, unction is, a, is an incredible and probably one of the most, um, you know, I don't want to say underrated, but um, least engaged sacraments that, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't even aware of. There's many people who, it's not, it would not be shocking to hear if someone's like, yeah, I don't know if I've ever had unction. You know, I mean that that could it's sure. it sounds odd, but it's just, you know, it isn't on the same level frequency like obviously confession or the Holy Eucharist, Holy Eucharist, but it is a sacrament. Um, Why the seven priests, Father? Um, well, there's a well, there's a smaller rite, and then there's the larger one, in which there's you know gospel readings. Now, accordingly, like each priest will like take a gospel, sure. reading, right? Um, but the what we do here, we do what's um, the, our monthly version. We do like a, the shorter, right? Which just one priest can obviously do, and one priest can do it. But you know, there's a lot of grace with <laughs> a lot more priests, you know, and that's typically how you see it served uh, during Holy uh, Holy Week with multiple priests. Probably so, not in America, though, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it just depends, like. Um, a lot of times priests will say, you know, if all oh, depending on your context, like here in Kansas City, we have some pretty we have pretty good relationship, uh, me and a couple of the priests, um, which, you know, that's not always the case. And, you know, like, hey, you let's have unction at my parish or your parish, whatever. And it's very good because having multiple priests and if you can, deacons really help because there's multiple anointings. Right? Sure. Sure. So that's that's a help, you know. Okay. But like I said, there is the small right that we do, 
um, which will just have the single anointing. So, what's the difference between chrism and unction? Okay, so holy chrism is holy chrism is the continuation of the laying of the hands of the apostles. So the holy chrism in which the the seal and the gift of the Holy Spirit is presented. This comes from the ancient times in which when the apostles could no longer be everywhere present, they blessed holy oil, laid their hands upon it, and that holy oil was given, dispersed, and that was the proxy of their laying on the hands upon the believer and the, sure. the, the bestowing of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so to this day, every uh, patriarch will have um, their chrism and there's always like a little, there's always an amount left and they just build or, or not build, but they'll make more and they'll, they'll, it will be added to that. Therefore, you know, um, a whole new batch is made very much in the same sense with holy water. If you have holy water and you, you're about to run out, you pour water in with, the, with that little bit of holy water and that water now becomes blessed. It's, it's blessed, you know. I actually so, have a question about that, Father. What is the difference between your blessing and me blessing? Like if I bless food, what's the difference between that and um, like, you know, uh, me blessing food? Well, I, I think um, there's a couple things like on that level of blessing food, you know, we're, we are operating, I would say it's, it's fair to say we're operating in the priesthood of the believers right because it says in peter that um because there's there is the priesthood of, of law believers according to uh, peter in which um we are a holy nation a royal priesthood right and all christians are called into this this royal priesthood of christ and it, it, it this gets into what does it mean to be a priest and the offering of of life and the and matter to back to god you know so um Every man, woman, and child in the church, if they've been received, if they're in the church, baptized and chrismated, they are ushered into this anointing, right? Because they're anointed with chrism and uh, to you, what you, you anoint a king, right? Remember Christian, right? Christ means anointed one. That's what Christ means, right? Okay. Anointed one. And so Christians are, you know, even though it was a pejorative term initially, According to the book of acts it's an it's one who's anointed and that anointing is is that kind of micro of the broader historical spiritual cosmic anointing uh of of this royal this, this kind of kingship that we partake in in christ right um it's also part of this calling into the priestly service okay so you blessing food and me blessing food there's you know, it's I guess one thing to say is um, the real issue comes in regards of like performing certain, like obviously the Eucharist, confession, you know, things that are um, only given uh, to a priest in regards of authority by Christ through the hands of the bishop, you know? Mm -hmm. So in one sense, we're blessing food that's fine but we start moving to other things i mean you're just shooting blanks <laughs> you, sure. you know so um so when a priest offers a blessing for food of course there's some gravitas to that as opposed to a layman because of the um, ordination the ordination which is also a sacrament yeah that's my that's my segue you know so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the thing. So um, then I have to ask a question. This might prove, I just don't get it because it might seem a little bit too legalistic, but I like theophany, the blessing of the water. When like a priest, you know, when the priest throws the cross in like out in California, they throw it out into the ocean, correct? Uh -huh. Okay. So does that mean like, if the they whole, can, yeah. it, does that mean the whole ocean is blessed? And like, how long does that blessing last? I, maybe this is too legalistic. I'm just trying to understand like where the legalism ends 
because there is like a nature to this stuff and i don't want to like say oh well the blessing is limited to 15 yards by 15 yards. you know what i mean like yeah i mean the oceans you know if you want to go to the if you want to go down that you know line of thinking once once the god man incarnated on the planet was baptized in the waters of jordan i mean that's yeah you know what i mean i mean from from that point on it's like uh, the blessing extends but you know we we recognize um that you know sin uh is a pollutant you know and um that's why you bless houses every year right sure so, Oh, did your house get dirty? You yeah, know, of course it did. You know, you clean your bathroom. Of course you do. Right. So, um, it works, you know, it works in the same way. So this, this gets into the whole thing of like, um, ritual purity, you know, all these things that are very real, you know, um, and it speaks to the incarnational reality of our faith. Mm -hmm. that, and this is really important because I think sometimes that can be, you know, lost in the background is that this is everything we talk about here is incarnational. And, it, and when you keep that in mind, it could even just, it's almost like if you were to go back, just pick an episode and then just like put on like the incarnational lens on it. It's almost like you could be receiving a whole different episode or, or the, the conversation is different, if that makes sense, because it becomes easy for this to fall into this disembodied abstract thing and it's it's really not you know it's it's incarnational and it's very concrete you know and the sacraments are the means by which <clears throat> that is manifested yeah incarnational realities i mean that's kind of what i was i mean because like it's not like something nice to do to bless the water you know it's not just like a oh it's a nice little ritual thing that we do at theophany it actually does bless the water and I didn't know like the incarnational reality of like that blessing and like what that blessing is, how far does that blessing go? How far does it last? That type of stuff. Cause I know there is a nature to it and I don't want to act like it's not just like, you're not sprinkling like a wand over water or anything like that. Like there is like something going on. So, um, so then Cyprian, unless you have any questions, I was going to move on to, I'd, I'd like to just, and by the way, if you if it if it sounds like there's a herd of elephants running behind me, um, that I, a massive storm just dropped on our heads. So like it's crazy. It's just wild out here right now. Sure. I'm looking around. <laughs> uh, no, I love I, I, I want to. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love Saipan. That's the brand here, by the way, folks. Like that's a literal brand here. Um, the the incarnational this idea of the incarnational lens. Can we dig a little further into that, like, and how sacraments are that are when we say incarnation, are we talking about the incarnation of Christ? Are we talking about like the embody the embodiment in that? I'm trying to I'm trying to understand like how do, how do we properly understand the idea of the incarnational lens that you said? Because I think that's an interesting term. Sure. So yes. So the incarnation of Christ makes possible this incarnational reality. And so when you, when you realize that Christianity, the orthodoxy is not a philosophy, right? So it isn't a um, exclusively a um, approach of morals and 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 thought right but it but it is a way of existence and being on an ontological level in, in a holistic sense so the incarnation of christ with with christ being brought forth the god man making this bridge between the human and the divine therefore that bridge being established we can now enter into this experience of the divine participating in this life but that participation because god came to save man and man is you know um 
soul and body that's what we are you know spirit and body like we don't have a body and a spirit like that's what we are um the whole of man must be like dealt with which is this is getting into like the councils which is getting into the creed right because there are these um the reason why people can read the creed and read the minutes of the ecumenical councils and be like why are they so particular about this or that because the fathers aren't being nitpickier or getting into semantics it's like if for instance what can't be assumed can't be saved right so uh and forgive me everyone out there i, I don't have coffee with me right now but i try to remember which father that was that said that but the reality is is that there's so much that the fathers defended in regards of like christ's humanity because if there's an aspect of Christ's humanity that doesn't line up with ours, it isn't possible for that aspect of us to be saved. Does that make sense? So every aspect yeah. of, it, of what it means to be human, like, because Christ is the second Adam, and so he does what the first Adam couldn't do. And so he takes humanity in, in its totality, and redeems it, right? Brings it to this place through participation of the divine life. Now, that participation, if you don't have the sacraments, then it is all just head games. It is just this kind of like ideology, philosophy, it's all disembodied, right? Um, but through the sacraments, the manifestation of this life is total. Not just, it's, it's love the Lord God with all thy mind, with all thy heart, with all thy body, right? Like. Like this is this is how that's done. The sacraments are the are the the primary and premier way that the incarnational life is manifested. When we say incarnational, we mean embodied. We mean um, it is concrete, existing. Period. <laughs> like like that's that's what we mean. Which is remember Gnosticism and the Gnostics like. But one of the primary ways of Gnostic thought is this disembodiment, that the body is this cage and like, you know, and, and most people, many, quote, most Christians in America, unfortunately, have a very strong Gnostic thread through that. You know, they don't even know this, you know. Um, and this is important because this is part of the reason why so much of orthodoxy is the fullness of the faith not just historically, but because orthodoxy alone perfectly articulates and reveals the fullness of how, of, of God's economy of salvation, of how God saves men, not just why, but how, right? And so this incarnational lens is, is, the, is the half of this, right? The mind, the soul, but the body as well. The, this is, I've been thinking, I, I've, I've been, uh, Jordan Peterson has been on my mind mm. lately because he just is, has this thing with Daily Wire now and he's putting out a whole bunch of new content. And the one thing that has been striking me is the head game aspect of it, right? And one of the things that brought me to orthodoxy was the embodied aspect of it was that it's, we're not talking about metaphors. We're not talking about like, there's an embodied reality that's tangible, something is happening. And so, so the incarnational lens is the, tell me where I'm wrong here, Father. It's, it's, it's something like the understanding or the, or the acknowledgement of the experience that is in the physical realm of of the bridge of the bridge that is made by Christ into the physical realm and that through the sac since the sacraments are physical mm -hmm. in nature mm -hmm. that that it's that that's the body connection that's the mystical body connection am i close yeah you yeah i mean yes I, I think maybe another way we can approach this is um or stargates <laughs> yeah i think you said that before father yeah like how how would okay 
you can imagine a marriage that's just on paper. Right? Sure, they exist. Those they exist. exist. <laughs> and, and, and because they do exist, it almost proves the point more because no one thinks of that as a true marriage. Right? This is, this is a really good analogy, I think, right? Because like, okay, yeah, they're married, whatever. Consuelo and, uh, you know, Janie, they're married, whatever. It's like, it's all paper. It's just so Consuelo could get her papers. And, you know what I mean? Like, we all can imagine that situation, right? And like people go like, well, yeah, they're married, but no one's gonna go like, yeah, they're married. You, you, you know what I mean? There's a whole process, but that's one has to go through to be like, okay, and I've gone through it with people. You know, I've gone through this, like, okay, check, like, you know, do they have children? Like all these things, right? Everything that the government checks to see if that's an authentic marriage is incarnation. Hmm, oh, very good. You, you, okay. You see what I'm saying? Okay. You see what I'm saying? Because it. it's like, okay, yeah, you're married, right? Like, okay, on paper, I can see this, like, blah, blah, blah. But, like, you know, you, do you have kids? Do you cohabitate together? Like, are there taxes together? You know what I mean? There's all these things that are, that are, that are tangible, right? That's how they want to measure if it's a real marriage or if it's false. And this is really important because Ephesians 5, right? When Paul talks about the marriage as an icon of the church, <laughs> right? So it's, it, it, it works perfectly, right? Does that, does that help to make sense? Yeah, really? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, the, yes. so the sacraments. Which is why. So the sacraments me, are the you, proof, really. Well, They're the, the proof. The proof, which is why, forgive me again, this is like a thing. It's like. You know, a lot of people struggle, like I'm dealing with this right now with someone, it's common, right? Um, I've seen it so many times where people just struggle with like, they have an Orthodox spouse or they think Orthodox is cool, they come around and after a while they start getting, two things will happen, they either get mad because they can't have communion or they just like, I gotta become Orthodox, right? And the thing is, is like, uh yeah like like you and those spaces you know something's being communicated to you that this is an authentic thing i mean you know on and on i can tell you so many stories about people being like that's the that's the crux is the sacraments right because outside of that you are just dealing with like theory and like you know i'm gonna pretend to be a, a funk you know what i mean but it's like you're not a funk. You can you can watch Andrew all day and get creepy and stalk his wife and his kids and you know his his like sister and try to emulate them. And this, but people are gonna, it's like ah oh, like yeah you kind of got his mannerisms but like yeah, you're not really a funk. You know what I mean? Because there hasn't been this ex, there there hasn't been this I don't want to say transaction. There hasn't been this. Um, experience yeah you know what I mean? it's an experience you're either born into it you're married into it you know like you know but something happens. that's the initiation right it's initiation it's initiation so, okay so then so okay this is helpful which is so, baptism. which is baptism so that's what i was about to ask right so baptism is the baptism is the first that has to proceed Everything. Because because it is preparing, it is preparing the person to be able to even encounter the others. Is that what it is? Yes. So baptism and chrismation are the two eyes, if you will. Some of the fathers would talk about is like two eyes. And there is a father, I think it was St. Neilis, don't quote me. He even talks about he had this vision and he saw people in heaven that were blind, you know, because they didn't receive baptism. You know, that's a whole other story. It's like blah blah blah. But the, the they like receive is, as then they were never baptized or they didn't like they got baptized but didn't like take quote unquote. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. No, no. That they that that they weren't. I know that's that's problematic for some people. But like, let's get into it because like we're coming off of this whole you know five month long discussion on like ecumenism, whatever. But like this this thing is you have to understand. 
Um, and this is going to be upsetting for some people, but like corrective baptism. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I, I mean, uh, yes. And, and to, to dial that back, even I'll just say just getting baptized period. Like there's a lot of people who like just it's it's more and more common. Like ask Chris me, ask Chris me. I just want to say if you can hear me and you're gonna get received, get baptized. Don't don't fool around with it. Just get baptized because um I will tell you from experience on a lot of levels, just first of all, the baptism is not some empty, empty like right. It isn't an outward working of an inward sign. As you know, our astute um, uh, evangelical or Protestant, you know, neighbors would say, like, um, baptism matters because something's actually oh, happening. I never heard that before. That's kind yeah. of messed up. Yeah, baptism okay. matters because it's actually happening, right? And this gnostic. gets into a whole. Go, I'm sorry. That's very gnostic. The outward sign of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we're working. Yeah, it is, and it and it's. Baptism is an actual, it's an actual transformation that happens. It's, it's grace is bestowed upon a person. A cleansing of their, of their person is actually bestowed. And then the chrismation is the bestowing of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can rest upon a person, no problem. This is the only thing we can talk about. This is getting into like, you know, because there's, The order of of sacraments are, and in this order, in regards of how you receive, baptism is the first one, right? Well, let me, this gets a little, gets a little funky because someone say like, technically you, you, technically many people get confession first, then baptism, right? But this gets an old thing because there's the that's convert. There's but... the absolution that happens during the baptismal service as well. But you know, de facto confession, right? Someone's absolved that next day or that or that morning they're baptized, right? So life confession, absolution, baptism, chrismation, right? So the the confessing of the sin, the absolving of the sin. The baptisms, you know, in the incarnational fulfillment of that, right? The completion of that, the sealing of the, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the person, right? And the, and the, and then the sacrament of um, Holy Eucharist. That those four can make up that table by which everything else is laid upon. Those four things, right, make up the, the sacramental table that everything else is laid upon in which a person enters into the life of the church. Now, this is key because people wrongly, 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 I'm going to say it two more times, wrongly, wrongly see baptism and receiving communion as like, I did it, I crossed the finish line. No, like, I want to quote Gandalf. No, you fool. <laughs> like yeah. No, it is the beginning. It is, it's like, I would look at it like people look, I cross the finish line and I would say, no, what it is, is you've got your training, here's your gun, get out there and start doing something. Like that is the beginning. And that really kind of makes the difference from my perspective on how people move forward, right? So. So Father, may I ask real quick, this is a much better perspective, I think, than what I was gonna go with. I was gonna run through the seven and kind of give a breakdown of each, but I think actually that's kind of happening organically. And I think it's actually better to talk about what sacraments are in general. Mm -hmm. So I I just want to address that. Yeah, I was going to go this way, but I think this way is better. So that, because sometimes when I listen to podcasts, I could hear that someone was trying to do something and it gets Mm -hmm. cut off and it was kind of like weird for me. So I just want to address it. Secondly, the thing I want to say is, um, what would be the circumstances of someone not receiving baptism if they were converting? Like a receiving an Orthodox baptism, a capital so, B baptism. Yeah. So unfortunately what's happened because of certain movements. Ecumenism. Yes. Um, the idea became that the form of the baptism is valid. So in other words, the, the baseline is Trinitarian triple immersion. 
And there was a time when let's, you know, our good friends, the Catholics did that. That was a while ago, <laughs> right? Like a while ago. Most people are listening to this, their time. That's the, it's been a while since they've done that, right? I so Brits like you, right? Yeah, so it was under those auspices that, um, quote unquote, I'm going to be charitable because I'm feeling spicy. So I'm going to like push against that. Quote unquote, well-intended theologians and hierarchs were like, well, let's be charitable, blah, blah, blah. And we will acknowledge that these baptisms are valid and therefore just give chrismation. Well, um, not so much because you don't even know. Like you don't know how people are baptized now, especially, right? There's just like, you don't know what they're baptized into. They don't know what form, all that stuff, right? And that, those things matter, right? Um, and so that's, that's the context in which many people actually find themselves. In fact, it's gotten so bad that some quote unquote parishes, priests, they won't even really like, it's almost like they go out of their way to not baptize people. You get all wet and stuff. Come exactly, on. exactly. It's like a laziness or something. So, um, so that that's the context of kind of where it comes from, you know. Um, and it's just it's really a pernicious thing because it undermines so much, you know. And then again, I can tell you stories. You know, it's like, um, you know, I I know I know a nun who, um, you know was baptized and um she'll tell you she's like it's like i it's like i had never read the gospel before hmm. you know lifelong catholic you know and got received the orthodox baptism thanks be to god and was like yeah it's like i'd never read the gospel before like we can go on and on like that's that's a real thing you know not everyone will have something as strong like that happen but these things are are a mystery, which that's sacraments are. That's what we're like mystery, right? They are a mystery in which the grace of God in all its fullness will oftentimes move imperceptibly to the person. Um, but nevertheless, that that power is there. You know? So then I have a little bit of a thinker, Father, and maybe you already have an answer for this. Should people, you know graciously should people who are not married within the orthodox church get remarried oh yeah i did yeah i did <laughs> yeah okay That's, that was a quick that, response <laughs> that 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 happened that happened here after right the day after my baptism and chrismation yeah we got remarried we, into the orthodox church wow mm -hmm. yep which is so father joyful. father performed it <laughs> yeah it was so joyful so joyful you know hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you can, you should, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. okay. Sure. Some priests that you know they can do something, and I know there'll be people like, "Ah, oh, it's an invasion, blah blah." But they'll do a crowning service, you know. But like, whatever, you should get, you should get your marriage blessed. You should get married in the church. Yes. So if you're married like in a Protestant church, you could talk it over with your priest about maybe getting remarried. I would. Okay. okay. Because I mean that that service is incredible. I mean, there that service is absolute. It's blessing. And, and let me just tell you something else. It's just like I had a I had a friend, you know, um, and I think I've already told the story before. But she's like, "Well, I don't want to get baptized. My youth pastor baptized me. All this sentimental stuff. I liked him and blah blah blah. And I just don't want this." I was like, "Look, why would you not want everything the church has for you? Like, 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 why would you not want that? You know?" And it's just it's this. It's it's the it's a wrong mindset that people have inherited. I'm trying to be charitable. People have inherited it. You know what I mean? So this is important because, you know, let me give you an example. Uh, I will like I I when I get the opportunity, I like to do enrichment with couples. And thanks be to God, I think it, I think it's you know, I think the people I've done enrichment with, I have. With God's help, I think I think they would say it's been helpful. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure. Uh, and the the thing I really try to teach them explicitly and implicitly is learning to to draw on the grace of the sacrament. You know, it's like you like this is <clears throat> excuse me. It's something a lot of people don't know. It's like let me look, guys. You're like I can't do it, God. I can't do it. I'm just I'm done. Okay. You can literally get on your knees, make the sign of the cross, 
And if you're willing to sacrifice with pain of heart, you can say, Lord, you know, we were married in the church. We have the sacrament of marriage. Please help us. You know what I mean? You can, you can, because that's a covenant that you haven't just made with yourselves. It's with God yeah. in the church. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's grace in that. It's just like, um, you know, <laughs> hearkening to our, our part of our conversation earlier, like, what 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 can and should give a parent hope if they have a wayward child is that baptism because the grace in that baptism although it seems like it's gone it's just latent it's waiting for that opportunity to be activated but it's there sure, sure. well this 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 brings up this was something earlier this week i had a thing happen i i uh, reached out to you father about it and you mentioned this exact concept where my youngest my three-year-old it's she she did something that was it was completely i mean I, I i'm happy to tell the story because it was completely it was shocking to me right is that she's you know she's got a six-year-old uh sister and she kind of copies after her and so usually if she she does something and she gets yelled at or not she, we don't really yell in the house, but somebody, you know, snaps at her. What are you doing? You know what I mean? And she's in the middle of something. She'll cry and say, oh, you're mad at me. You're mad at me. You're mad at me. And it was like three mornings ago or four mornings ago. I'm working in my office and I hear her start something. She's spilling things, throwing water around. And her mother says, what are you doing? What are you doing? And she starts crying a little bit. And then. I hear her mom is cleaning things up. Oh, let me clean you up. And she said to my wife, she said, do you forgive me? She didn't mm -hmm. say you're mad at me. You're mad at me. She was like, do you forgive me? And my wife said, of course I forgive you. What do you, of, of course. And I was just like, where, where, where did that come from? Yeah. That's where did that come from? And I immediately, I was like, I need to, I need to tell father turbo about this. And that was your response to me. Father turbo was like, she's baptized. Yeah. Right. Like there's, there's a grace there. That's right. It and just, that's, things need to be in order in order for it to manifest. That's right. That, that's, that's something. Right. And forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I think this is important, Cyprian, that we put in that place of what I said to you about that order though, because you're part of that. What did I say? You said, because her father's in order now. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I think it's important that people hear that part. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> because her father is in order. And therefore, mm -hmm. the proper channels are there, and there's could be a nice flow of grace. It's important because it, all that's real, right? A, a, a God fearing father sh shepherding, protecting, providing, caring. I don't care all you think I'm being old fashioned, Crisco, whatever, get out of here. I don't care. Like, I'm telling you, that's how it works, right? Like, a father, a god father who's supporting, shepherding, caring for, providing for his god wife and her children. All of those pieces are not disjointed. They're in line so that there's proper circulation, flow, all that. All, that's how that works, right? You can be disjointed and don't be circulation flow. Things can get in there, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's not the same with... <laughs> you get it lined up and it's just like the power's on and just like things, things are flowing, you know? And anyone who's actually repented, no one's going to, no one's going to, you know, keyboard attack me and be like, that's yeah. crazy. It's like, no, it's, it's true. Everyone knows like, yeah, that's true. It, it's just, you can experience it, you know? And this is the incarnational. So this is the incarnational aspect that we're talking about is to where, because that to me, hearing so i mean i'm hearing this from my office go on right but that moment i was because i was racking my brain of you know of course my wife and i in our private conversations with each other if there's something we'll ask each other's forgiveness mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. um thankfully thank god there's not been a situation where we have blundered so heavily that that we have had to ask our children for forgiveness yet right but i'm assuming that that is going to come at it's some coming. point obviously <laughs> right right oh boy i'm in trouble right I've done that all the time. <laughs> so so 
it was it was just it was absolutely striking to me where I said this couldn't have come from anything but God. Like that, that, that it's that it, something has happened inside of this child that was like this. And it was a, a complete flip. Right. It was not something that it was like, oh, well, you should do this. And oh, yeah, now you're asking for forgiveness. And that's great. It was just. Where does this well, come from? Yeah. And that's that's what I, I was talking. And I'm an, I'm an older guy, so maybe I've already said this. I'm just repeating my stories. But I was talking with a brother from the church. This was a couple months ago. And we were talking about like growing up and watching TV and stuff. And it didn't really seem to affect my children the way that it does, or doesn't it seem to affect us the way it seems to affect my children and like the world in general, whatever the world is, insert it. It's like, it's like, why does this seem to just throw my children so out of whack? And he was, and he brought up to me, he was like, well, they're baptized. They literally are experiencing the world differently. If we were to, God forbid, put them in public school, like they would be experiencing everything differently than every other person. That's that incarnation. That's like the, the reality of the situation is, is that I've lived a life, you know, 27 years or something like that of not being baptized. And then I've lived whatever, eight years or whatever of being baptized. And I can say that like, uh, there's a stark difference in the way that I experience things. There's a stark reality, like movie stars stop being so cool. Like you start to see like the humanity of like musicians. They're no longer gods, you know, like you're like, wow, Jello Biafra is kind of actually an idiot. He's not like this, like, you know, like little demigod or whatever. And like, then you start to like, and I remember like long before he was a priest, I was talking to father about this. We were sitting at reconciliation and father and I were talking about it. And I said something like, yeah, I'm just not really sure. And I've maybe even baptized like a year and a half, two years, something like that. I was like, I'm just not really sure anybody in the government or whoever really knows what they're doing. And you said at the time you were like, yeah, that's how, you know, you're becoming Orthodox is because like, you're just starting to see through some stuff and like, that's my daughter. I mean, my daughter is like, she's, you know, we'll see what happens. But she's like, I want to be a nun when I grow up. Like, I, I want to be a nun. Like, that's, that's what I want to be. And you know what kid says that? And like, that was scandalized my family. Like my family, like my uh, extended family was like, uh, well, yeah, but you know, the, you can be anything you want to be, dear. I was like, shh, shh, shh. like, shut up, shut up, shut up. Like, you can be a, like, let her be a nun. If she wants to be a nun, that's fine. Like, like you can be an astronaut i'm like what will that do what will that we can have another person up in space like no we're fine if they're even going to space at all who knows like i'm just like no 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 she's fine the way and that's that's the stark reality is is like that and like uh, uh mother elizabeth has talked about kids running around in church and then they stop at an icon and kiss it and then keep running around you know like what kid does that you know like i don't know i'm just kind of yammering here but like i it the, it, it it is it's it's a huge it it, it does become well, the thing like this too is is remember that baptism is initiation into the kingdom of god it isn't it isn't the initiation to a set of rules it isn't the initiation to like a way of thinking it's initiation into a kingdom where there's a king and there's a court and there's subjects and people and you, you know what i mean like that's what that's what baptism ushers them into and like some kids will see angels you know what i mean it's like this is this is a thing you know and all of reality getting back to the baptism in that sense is 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 becoming blessed being put in proper order that i mean that's what it is you know blessing is 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 things being put in, in proper economy and order and flow according to God's goodness and love, right? So getting back to what you're saying, like when you bless food, it's like, yeah, there's that aspect of priesthood in which you're blessing, you're, you're, you're bringing into order, you're bringing into the good order and flow and economy of, of God, right? It, you're bringing creation back into that right order. That's what that's what blessing is, you know. So, this is what children are, and all people are ushered into in their baptism. 
And the confession, the absolution is the, you know, in one, in one sense, the, the cutting of the, 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 the sack of waters, the, the kind of the, the, um, the opening, if you will, like where um, the child is able to kind of come through. You know, that's what the, that's what the, the confession does. It, 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 it clears away the dead husk of sin and the blindness in which a soul is, is you know, held hostage to, right? And then it's able to enter into this new life. And then it's, it's made clean. The vessel is cleaned, right? It's scraped with the, with the confession. It's washed in the baptism. And then it's filled with goodness, with the oil, the Holy Spirit. It fills, doesn't rest on top of like the rest of the world, because the Holy Spirit's in the rest of, in all of the world, right? Oh, heavenly key, oh, comfort of the spirit of truth, who are present, and fillest all things, right? Everywhere present, fillest all things. The Holy Spirit, since the time of Pentecost, is now in the world, resting upon people. Before in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit were only resting on a couple of certain people. Now, with the descent of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in the world, and it's filling everything. This grace is there now. Now, through the life of the church and the sacrament, the Holy Spirit is actually indwelling people, not just resting on top, but actually, and so the Holy Spirit indwells only those who have been received through chrismation. That's, that's, that's the thing, right? So full stop, like, yeah, full stop. Yes. Yeah. And that makes sense to me because I mean, you know, going into a spiritually minded program like Alcoholics Anonymous, like I did, where you're having people interact with God and it's kind of tripping you out because you're not really sure what's going on. But then that the difference being that they're, you know, indwelling the indwelling of the Holy spirit, you know, that, that, that made a lot of sense to me, but I have a question that's going to derail us just a little bit, but I promised myself I was going to ask it and it has to do with ordination to an extent. So father Melchizedek, right. I was reading I was reading in um, Hebrews uh, and the Orthodox study Bible. I just wanted to know what you thought of this. We don't have to go into the whole thing that they had proposed the theory that Melchizedek was the pre-incarnate Christ. Because like the order of Melchizedek was so hardcore and there was such a purity needed to it that that they they proposed it was a because not much known is known about Melchizedek. Now, Father, just say no. That's not. I mean, I, I don't know what your opinion. I'm is. not. I you know I'll tell you what what we can say, which is that's what's important. Melchizedek is definitely a typology of Christ. We can say okay. we can, that's no problem. You know what I mean? No problem. Anything past that with some sort of authority and assurance, I'm not. I don't want to speculate. Right, because because that's the thing. Like, I don't want to speculate. Like, especially. Oh no! There. Yeah, no, no, no. You know what I, mean? I didn't know if so, I stumbled into a bigger world or something. Yeah, that's that. Because the a whole thing where you know it's kind of like um, uh, you know, when I was in uh, when I was overseas, whether it was in Iraq or the Balkans, um, you know, when there was these areas that were hot you know, because we're seeing fire, stuff like that, you know, and it's, it's business, you know what I mean, business, because there's, there's fire, right, like, live fire, ammunition, shells, and guns, and bullets, right, but then when, when we get back to, you know, wherever, back to the fob, you know, back to relax a little bit, you know, people play cards, people play darts, <laughs> you know what I mean, uh, you're, you're still in a war zone, Right, but you can relax a little bit and like, oh, you know, play some cards or whatever. The discussion about Kizadek's like that. It's like you know, relaxing a little bit, like ah, blah blah blah. It's good. It's what we would call the Lunguma. It's like this kind of like theological opinion. Okay. Right? Okay. It, but it, but it happens, you know, not on the field. Right. We're not on the field where it's like, hey. Stuff that, is real, it's flying, you know what I mean? Shed that pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. It, it's, it's, you know, I didn't know if I'd like stumbled onto something and then I would say that and be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's known. Like that's yeah. known. Yeah, but, typology, yeah. that's good enough. Anything yeah. more than that's not gonna, 
you know, because it's the, yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay, cool. Yeah. So then, um, uh, ordination, uh, St. John Chrysostom's got a whole book mm -hmm. on it, a whole ho book of homilies on it. Um, one of the things that was immediately, I had never crossed my mind when my cousin approached me about Orthodox Greek, the Greek Orthodox Church, because uh, he was Greek Orthodox, was this idea of apostolic succession, um, which to those not in the know or whatever, um, it, that's this idea that the apostles uh, ordained who, and then those who they ordained, ordained, those who were ordained, ordained all the way down to Father Turbo and beyond. You know, so there's this unbroken line of authority given from Christ, Christ or Holy Spirit. I believe it's Christ, right? Yeah, Christ. And, and not, it's not an idea. It's a fact. It's a. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. Forgive me. The fact. Not the to be, not to be, you know. No, 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 no. It's important. Language yeah. is important. The fact that Christ ordained, then he, they ordained, then they ordained. And that is an unbroken chain. <clears throat> And the line is bishop to bishop, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. That's that. So we're tracing the we're tracing bishops. Oh, I don't know if I knew that. Okay. Yeah, because sure. yeah, because what it priest. is for the pre what it is for a priest or a deacon, a presbyter, or and those of you who don't know, if you're reading the New Testament, depending on your translation, when you read in the New Testament, like in in the epistles, the pastoral epistles of Paul, like in Timothy and such, when it says elder, or like in Revelation it says elder. The word there is presbyter, which is priest, right? So a priest or a deacon, elder, um, they they serve at the behesting of the bishop. So it all it's all traced to the bishop. Oh, so, so it's like my papers check out through my bishop, right? That's that's how that works. So it's more like the bishop's the branch and the priest are the leaves. Yeah, that's yeah. a good analogy. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, I got gotcha. you. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, authority is given then to the priest uh, from the bishop, you know, through apostolic succession to perform sacraments then. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then is it always necessary to become a deacon first? Like, yes, yeah, so you're always made a deacon first, but... Um, this gets into a real quick thing. I don't need to belabor this, but in recent years, the idea kind of default of seeing the diaconate as a stepping stone to the priesthood, that's how it's seen by most people. And I'm one of those big proponents of that stopping. Um, we need more deacons. We need people who feel that particular vocation of the diaconate because it's super important and, um, you know, deacons are, they're just super important into the vitality and the, the, the kind of dynamic nature of, of a community, you know. So, are there sacraments that can be served by a deacon? Or how, what is their relationship to the sacraments yeah, beyond so, assisting a priest? So like a deacon in the Orthodox Church, as opposed to like the Roman Catholic Church, is very different. Um, in the Roman Catholic Church, you can a deacon is essentially an ordained layman. Um, whereas in the Orthodox Church, uh, the diaconate is, um, depending on who you're talking, like we could say like the first step of the priesthood. Um, although any, like the order is technically like there's subcategories of reader, um, subdeacon, right? But to be a little bit more just to the point, the deacon's the first step, like deacon, priest, and bishop, they're all um, a facet of the priesthood. They're this kind of like trifecta, if you will, of, of the priesthood, right? Which is appropriate, right? Um, so there's a Trinitarian aspect to that. Um, but the diaconate, like what is common is that you'll have someone who's like, okay, the bishop's like, you're gonna be a priest. So sometimes what will happen is the, the bishop will ordain the man deacon on a Saturday hmm. and then he's made a priest on a Sunday. That, that's very common, right? Some people it's like, okay, you know, well, maybe we'll see, but let's make you a deacon. You know, there'll be a deacon for 
a couple of years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, like I've, I've seen it all. Right. Um, you were like people, a year, right. Father, Huh? you were a geekin for like a year. Well, it was longer than that. Was it really? I don't know. Yeah. It was like, uh, uh like three years, two and a half years, three years, something like that. Yeah. 15, 15 to 18. So, um, so the deacon can sometimes look just like, yeah, this is my vocation. I, this is where I feel my capacity, which is awesome. It's blessed, you know? Um, and the role of a deacon is, is really particular. And it's one of those things I feel needs to go back, not change, not be innovation, not be innovative, but needs to go back to its original place in regards of like really being active in regards of the, the community. You know what I mean? Because deacons oftentimes are just kind of seen as liturgical ornaments, you know, but the diaconate has a particular vocation in regards of. Does you know, it make your job harder as a priest without a deacon? In some ways, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, life is always easier with a deacon for sure. Um, Father Turbo, 2022. That's a shirt right there. Life is always easier with a deacon. Yeah. Life is always easier with a deacon, you know? Um, so yeah, the, the diaconate is a very particular thing. And um, I just wish more men would be like into it and not like, as a stepping stone, like I said, but just be like, yeah, I want to serve my community, you know, um, and, and I want to really just, um, yeah, you, you know, it, someone, might, some, someone's going to be mad at me, whatever, but it, it's to some degree, you know, how some people, they just want to be nurses. I don't mean like just like, that's nothing. You know what I mean? But for, there's people who they're like, you know, I don't, I don't really want to be a surgeon, you know what I mean? But I want to be with people and help them and like, you know, a nurse, an RN, like an RN is like crazy. RNs do all kinds of crazy stuff, you know what I mean? But she's not a surgeon, or the he is not a surgeon, you know what I mean? Sure. I think that's a good analogy with a, with a deacon in some regards. You sure. Know? So They're content on being, you know, the mountain needs a base too. Mm -hmm. Not everyone needs to be the peak. It needs the ground too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so, yeah, so, um, so the deacon does, I mean, when you, anyone who's Orthodox, you know that the deacon does seemingly, uh, if not most of, of an incredibly large amount of the service mm -hmm. is, is run by the deacon, you know, deacon does all the litanies and just deacons running and moving around, you know, the deacon represents an angel, but the, but the, but deacons can't bless. Right. So, um, you know, St. Maximus will talk about this. Um, uh, St. Simeon will talk about this. Like, you know, a deacon has the charism to, to purify. Right. But a priest has the charism, has the, has the grace to illumine. Mm -hmm. You know. So we like, sorry, <laughs> they clean up and like think of the person to the priest they're like yeah, you know yeah um deacons are a bridge it's, there's so many ways to see deacon they're a bridge between like the people and the priest and in a certain way the deacons are the ones who really should be like from my perspective um you know being a deacon for a couple years and and being a priest it's like and and really um i didn't see necessarily my diaconate as a, as a stepping stone. The diaconate is this bridge to the material and in some regards, emotional needs of the people and the priest. You know what I mean? The, the, the diaconate, the deacon in many ways is like the sheep can be like a sheep dog for the shepherd to help keep the, the sheep in line, not in line in like, you know, help them, stay safe, stay in the fold, you know, watch out for wolves. You know what I mean? There's like, that's what a deacon should be doing. Like making sure that they're tended to, like the material needs are met, you know, like. Um, running people food, like. Yeah, like the deacon should be running, like the deacon should be the one in charge of like ministry for shut-ins, you know, 
the deacon should be the one who's like, hey, you know, the the Jones family, they can't pay their gas bill, you know, like, hey, father, blah, 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 you know what I mean? The deacon's the one who should be like, hey, father, you know, um, the Costas family, little Joey, ah, you know, I think he needs some confession and there might be even some demonic stuff going on with them, you know what I mean? Like, the deacon's the one who really kind of like can be an eyes and an ear for the priest so that the priest can really give attention to prayer and the study of the word that's why the diaconate existed that's why it was created you know so it's it's it is probably well it is such an underappreciated and un, and wrongly looked at vocation aspect of the church from my perspective i hate to drill down on this too much but if you had a deacon father how often would you be leaving the altar for the entrances yeah mm-hmm. essentially for the entrances that's it and for communion and bringing out the chalice you know mm-hmm. hmm. Hmm. so father you you brought up something about the demonic and since we're talking about the priesthood uh, uh i'm I, sure people you know where I'm going. You know where I'm going with this, and especially talking in terms of differences of uh, Roman Catholicism and the Orthodox Church. Could we talk a little bit about uh, exorcism and the Orthodox approach to oh, that is exorcism? Not that was where I was going. Uh-huh. Where did you, where'd you think he was going? Where did you think you knew where I was going, that. right, Father? You knew yeah. that I was going there. I thought you were talking about that priest that was defrocked and is now being accepted back or whatever oh no i'm not I'm, i wasn't bringing that up <laughs> but that's yeah he, he probably needs an exorcism there's yeah. some people involved there that yeah. need an exorcism for yeah. sure people bringing them in need one yeah exactly. um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so yeah so like um that's an interesting thing you know i'll just give someone like kind of an insight you know um a very common thing that happens notice I said common, I didn't say frequent, is that people will have demonic problems and the people that they're brought to can't handle it. And they'll say, you need to call a priest. That's a well-known, well-documented common thing, you know? Um, The approach to the demonic in regards of the, of the priesthood, um, it, there is a, there, Stateside, there's a difference for sure. Um, I can't speak overseas because I'm not, you know, but stateside, there's there's a difference in regards of, um, you know, Orthodox pre, the, they're, you know, this is, this is, I can be charitable here, you know, this is an area where I, I see Rome has like, you know, they, they got it going on in that area in regards of very much, the administrative strength of Rome plays and bodes well here in this in this regard, because once upon a time we have the office of exorcist in the Orthodox Church, but it's fallen out of disuse. Um, and depending on your bishop, depending on your situation, like most Orthodox priests. So this is interesting. Watch this. This is interesting. Um, May God help me put this out right. So in Rome, only certain priests are blessed to to perform exorcisms. And each diocese will have a diocesan exorcist, which is often unknown, by the way, like often unknown, right? Um, So it's a very particular thing, right? And the means in which that is examined and investigated and if I could make that distinction between exam and investigation, right? The means by which something's examined and investigated are, are very particular, right? And they include a full battery of psychological tests, a full battery of um, eyewitness accounts and affidavits that have to be looked at to even in, in the examination period before an investigation happens, right? So examination is like, look, let's look at this. Investigation is like, okay, let's go in and blah, 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 right? Okay. So that's very particular. Are you following me? Yes, indeed. But watch this. But every Orthodox priest performs exorcisms. 
every Orthodox priest performs exorcisms. Rome has, in many places, I, I'm not speak. I'm not going to speak for people who are um, Cedar of Contus. I'm not going to speak for people who are in these ultra, you know, rat rat sects. But I can speak for um, Novus Ordo people. Many of them don't receive the exorcism in baptism. If you're an Orthodox priest and you're doing it, you know, according to how you're supposed to, every Orthodox priest performs exorcisms because every baptism and making of a catechumen is preceded by a rite of exorcism. Mm. Right. Now, um, depending on where you're at, you know, you'll have some people that are like you know, if you're gonna actually perform an exorcism in the in the sense that we're talking about, you need a blessing bishop or or you already have some understanding um but it's 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 definitely no matter where you're cutting it um it's a very very serious thing um because the the one performing the exorcism and those involved in it become very much susceptible to demonic retribution um, and so, yeah, just speaking from experience, it's not something that, um, it's not talked about a lot. And when it is talked about, it's, it's not, um, talked about lightly because of the, the, the seriousness of it, you know? Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's really an interesting thing because, um, it's it it's sadly, but I think there's some truth I'm saying it, it's sadly one of the few things in which real kind of like I don't want to I don't know what the right word would be. Unity or like kind of recognition can happen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, because it's it's like a it's like a real thing, you know, in regards of the the need for it and the growing need for it. Um, I will tell you, again, we, should, we can move on after this, just in my short time, there's been like, there's been an increase I've seen in, in others, in meaning other priests I talk with, where it's just like, you know, if they weren't encounter, if they weren't aware slash encountering it, the last two years going on three years they definitely there's an uptick for sure i mean we're talking about demonic presence for sure for sure yeah for sure and that and that's 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 local in the sense of the priests i speak with or you know states i, I talk with priests all over the country but that's 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 what i mean by local you know what i mean that's not even getting into like stuff that's hap that's popping off in like Serbia or Greece or other places, you know, but by everything I've seen in regards of reading stuff and every, uh, by all accounts, I've talked with other priests and people, it's like, it's definitely kicked up, you know, for sure. I mean, isn't that, I mean, that's kind of one of the signs of like the age that we're in kind of maybe being a little bit closer to the, the end zone than, than not, you know, yeah. so um so I, have we have we missed have we covered all of the sacraments have we missed one i mean well first of all we don't really this idea of seven we subscribe to just kind of like by default but we don't really put a number on it like that but yeah you know like we covered ordination we covered baptism i wanted to talk about confession real quick um, yeah, we we touched on it, but didn't really. I got we got like twenty minutes left, and I wanted to ask Father real quick off the bat if there were things you wanted to, because if I had to pick, and I don't want to, it's uh, in some ways confession is incredibly important to me. It's it's a it's a sacrament that. I guess I'd say I would get maybe like quote unquote, like the most out of, and mind you, 
taking into fact like Eucharist is of course the you know top. I, I, I mean, I, the I, Eucharist is a it's a whole nother. That's kind of what I'm trying to get. It's a different thing. It's like, oh, I don't, I don't, I can't think of a proper analogy, but it's a different thing. Like the Paschal liturgy is liturgy, but it's it's a, it's a whole different liturgy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. There you go. There you go. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, so I wanted to see Father if there was things real quick because I know there's a lot of misconceptions about. Uh, confession um i know that one of them is this idea that you know you confess it it's kind of like the mob the mafia thing you go in and you confess you whack three guys or whatever and it's gone you know you can't be held against you type of thing um and uh that um i guess maybe like i don't know maybe that was the big one i felt like that there's other things i've always i've always kind of thought that maybe confession was a misunderstood uh, or maybe not put in its proper context sacrament, because I, I myself had a pretty Catholic understanding of it from an, and Catholic, I mean, legalistic. Um, I could do some pretty heinous things, you know, quote unquote, blah, 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 uh, and go into confession and it was taken care of. And, you know, like that can't be held against me later on. I, you know, my blah, 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 you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I, as I've confessed more and more, I've realized that that's definitely not the case, in, at least in the way I was thinking of it. So I, I kind of wanted to know if you wanted to touch on that, because, you know, I, it, it's, it's the one that I noticed, but like unction can take a minute to kind of sink in. Certainly with Eucharist, Eucharist takes probably all of Sunday afternoon and into Monday and into Tuesday to kind of sink in confession almost always you know lord of mercy if i if i've properly prepared and tried to do the best that i can i i feel lighter every time i walk away from it like and i and i know that like things can be dark in my life and i know it's just because it's been a couple of weeks since i've done a confession like my thoughts are jumbled i can't seem to really pray i'm heavier like my steps are heavier i'm more tired i'm crankier i'm restless i'm you know, discontent. And then I, I could do a confession. And at least that, that puts a major, it clears a lot of that stuff away, you know? And so, yeah. And, and, oh, that was the other one. It's not like a place to just check in. It's not a place to just kind of like, you know, well, this is what's happening with me. You know, it's a place to go in and be like, this is what I did. This is, these are the, these are the really awful things I did. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um there's so much i could say here you know i think um um it's almost i don't know I, I, it's almost it almost feels like it would be better for you to talk about your experiences than for me to talk about it but i think um man you know i don't even know where to start like a couple key things many confess but few repent um the this is this is one that might be a little bit more particular to me which may or may not be a good thing um but the confessional just isn't a place where you find um the absolution of sin but it's also a place where you can attain uh, and build virtue mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know i think it's really like, here's the thing, like confession is confession and you can have a, a terrible priest, you know, and ter they exist, you know, you can have a terrible priest, um, but if he's blessed, you know, um, to hear confessions, that grace is there and, and the confession still filled with grace. It's still valid, even though he's terrible, you know? I mean, it's like a heresy to believe otherwise, right? Not only is it a heresy, but it's just wrong. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's just, it's just wrong, you know? Uh, and, and like, sounds like, well, heresy is wrong. Yes, but remember, heresy is an opinion that you're holding on to in spite of asking to be corrected, right? Sure. Um, but it's just wrong in the sense that like, yeah, like, um, because the, so he, this is important to say, to cover what I'm about to say, the grace of the confession is not contingent upon the confessor. However, 
anyone who's had any time confessing, there's a difference between confessors, right? I mean, is that sure. yes? You, you know what I mean? So it's like it's um, like the confessor is like, well, just pray about it. Yeah. I'm like, okay, read the Bible. Yeah. Where? Yeah. Somewhere in the back. It's all good, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so everyone, you know, I mean, everyone has a different thing, and it's just like um, you know, confession is a big part of our community. You know, it's like, um, it's not like there's one standout sacrament or whatever, but I think people coming, I, well, I know people coming from a different context, probably the biggest change for them is their engagement in their confessional life. Mm -hmm. like, probably like the first thing they'll notice when they first come to the community is like, confession's different for them, right? I think that might be fair to say. Yes. So, um, I find myself like building a confession all week. Like I try to, it's like, I try to, mm -hmm. but like, that's something that happened like organically. Mm -hmm. and, and unless you had something you really needed to say, Father, I did have an angle I wanted to approach this from. So unless you got something you really like that, that you feel is important to say. Yeah, I would just say for people too, like there's just some, some little tips that I tell the spiritual children, but it'd be good to share with other people. Because if, even if you are, maybe not content where you're at, you know, learn to become content. And one of the ways you can do that is by praying for your confessor, you know? So like, it's a real simple prayer. Just ask the Holy Spirit to go before you and to speak through your confessor, you know, so that you could hear him as, as if from the Lord, you know, it's those small things can really help, help someone enter more fully into the sacrament of confession. You know? Okay before you before you go andrew uh, before, yeah. before you say i could we just quickly go over the danger of uh taking the eucharist without being confessed mm. yeah Excellent. that's a good one Excellent. that's that's a good one yeah it's it's um so everyone i'm gonna borrow from a homily of saint john maximovich you know everyone's gonna touch god Right. But, you know, when you touch God, are you are you purified and illumined or are you, you know, burnt to ashes? <laughs> you know what I mean? And and the fire of God, obviously, is the Holy Eucharist. Right. So the chalice. Right. And and the tongs. Right. Which the spoon is also can be called. It can also be called the tongs. You know, the coal is the Holy body and blood so in isaiah where it talks about the seraphim coming and isaiah says well i'm a man of unclean lips you know and the people of unclean lips and the seraphim takes the tongue with the hot coal and touches the lips of isaiah and, is, and he's cleansed right this is holy eucharist right the tongs right when people walk up to communion your arms are folded right like a seraphim you know with two wings they, they cover themselves right so you you are given the, the fire of God, the fire himself, right? Our God is a consuming fire. So in that, if you're not, if you're not properly prepared, then it is unto you as condemnation. But if you are properly prepared, it's unto you for salvation. Now, this is a key thing to understand because a lot of people don't understand this either. The Eucharist is not a piety reward. You don't like, oh, I'm good. I did everything perfectly right. I earned my, I earned my Flintstone vitamin. You know what I mean? Like that's not, that is not the Eucharist, right? So people go like, well, I don't get it. Okay, well, there is a mystery there because we are never worthy of the Holy Eucharist. However, although we are never worthy, we should be prepared, right? Preparation doesn't make you worthy in that sense. It just makes you able to enter into, right? You see that distinction I'm making, mm -hmm. right? So this is super key. And this is why um, there's certain things that like, and again, I just, this is me, whatever. If people want to complain, that's fine. But, you know, if you're in a situation where you got a priest who isn't, you know, warning you or teaching you these things, you know, or like more importantly, 
if you ask them about it, just like, oh, those things don't matter. You know, like, don't worry about fasting, you know, for giving it or like, you know, they're not teaching to abstain from certain things beforehand. I would be very cautious in that sense. Real quick, Father, what would should be some of the things, because I just learned some of this, some of the things you should abstain from before communion. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, um, obviously like conjugal. Okay. Uh, should be abstained before communion. Um, you know, you should be fasting um from a bare minimum of five hours on you know i don't want to get too technical but you know sure. and that and that's like low bar i mean you get to some places where it's like in some context like you haven't eaten you're not eating meat all week you know what i mean it's like it, it's some russians it's, came to saint mary's one time and they fast all weekend yeah friday to sunday yep yep and some people is like like no meat you know like if you've eaten meat within like i think it's like three three days it's like you know so there's just like a, a common baseline that like certain things like you know you should be really abstaining from you know so this is all to the discretion of the priest you know but what i guess what i feel comfortable saying is is like a good priest is going to have some measure you know what i mean there's no need to compare notes but if there's like oh it doesn't matter that's weird you know, it does matter, right? So it's just like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But what the details are, you know, I leave that to the priest. That's between him and the bishop and you. You know what I mean? But like, there are there, there are there are levels of preparation. You know, communion. You know, are you preparing through prayer, through fasting? You know, um, to receive to receive God. You know. So real quick. Um... I, this might be a touchy subject and maybe it's something we should say for next time because we only got about 50. Good. <laughs> What's that? Sounds good. Okay. Touchy. I feel like I've touched a lot today. I'm just like, uh, you know. <laughs> One of the things that I know for a fact was that somebody I knew was actively smoking pot and you told them that you that they cannot take communion while in the process in the lifestyle of smoking pot. Right. So um, I kind of didn't know if you wanted to touch on that real quick. Just you already did. That's good. I mean, t let's touch a little bit more. Like, why is that? Like, I, I know why I feel like it's not good, but like, I know the spiritual damage that pot does and that it's not as innocent as people think it is, certainly from a spiritual aspect, not let alone the physical. It does not relax you. That does not relax you. It tenses you up. You oftentimes get paranoid and freak out when you're on it. Yeah. A lot of times you end up in a really dark place or eating way too much junk food and sitting in front of a TV or playing video games for hours on end. None of which are con like conducive for a stress-free life. Well, it's a psychedelic too. And it will definitely... It's witchcraft. It will, it, yes, it will put you in touch with demons for excuse sure. Excuse me, let me correct myself. It's not witchcraft, it's sorcery. Sorcery, yeah, exactly. It's sorcery. Plant, plant plant medicine yeah. it's plant medicine there is a spirit there yeah. a real ganja spirit that is really yeah. there it's yeah sorcery. not good it's sorcery yeah so i mean the only thing i would say to that some someone might get mad at me and be like blah 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 whatever but i would just say if if here's the thing guys out there in zoom land youtube land whatever like you always have to understand something before anyone gets mad at me or says anything. Let's just put this way. Talk to your priest, whatever. If they want, they can talk to me, I'm, you know, but the other thing is if, if you feel like I haven't told you something before you come and try to knock on my door, you better ask yourself, why haven't I told you? Cause maybe I haven't been able to tell you. Cause there's a lot of things that like, I want to tell people, but they can't hear it. You know, and if I tell them, they just like, you know, they want, everyone wants to think that they can hear it. But like, the fact of the matter is, is like, I'll just, you know, I don't know if this is, um, I don't know if this is correct, but I'm just going to say, it, you know, like, I really agonize over my spiritual children because there are times where I'm just like, I want to be able to say something, but I'm like, you're not in a place to where you can hear it. And not in a sense of like, 
Yeah, even cry says this. There's not that I'm Christ, right? There are the many things I wish I, I I wish to tell you, but you you can't hear these things yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it isn't this kind of like, you know, uh, I'm not going to tell a three year old, you know, or or a, I'm not going to tell a six year old per se about the birds and the bees and stuff. You know what I mean? Like I don't mean it like that. I mean it like in your impudence, right? I'm not going to tell you something and you're not going to heed it because you're accountable. I'm not gonna tell you something where I know you're just gonna argue with me, right? And then make the thing worse. It's better for me to allow and to just pray and just, cause I have to carry that burden. It's better for me as a spiritual father to kind of carry that burden sometimes and just pray, pray, pray and look for those openings to share with someone because I know like they're too insolent of a place to where they can't receive certain things. Now that, now there are things where I'm like, I like are so grievous I have to be like, hey, okay, you cannot do this. You know what I mean? But I would just say it's, there's that's just because I know that could be things to be like, well, you know, I didn't hear that. Was like I'd say, well, there's a reason, you know what I mean? And and I hope that I hope people hear that even with their own priest because it's like before you start getting losing your mind and being like, Father, Father Luke, why didn't you tell me? Well, I'll just slow your horses and be like, huh? Would I even be able to hear that? Hear something from Father Luke? Yeah. Am, am I so proud or am I so like argumentative or am I so opinionated that like Father Luke tells you something I'm losing, I'm not going to do it anyways you know what I mean be humble be humble um it uh oh crap oh dang it okay yeah that's what I want if Father I've always kind of thought and maybe I'm wrong and I'm, I'm getting farther and farther away from the question I wanted to originally ask you but while I got you here and I'm thinking about it when you give like say I give you a bless, I ask you for a blessing to do. Say it's a fast day, and I and I text you and say, "Hey, Father, um, would it be okay if I ate meat today? That that's the only thing that's really available to me." Blah blah blah. Is that you kind of saying I'll take the heat for this? Like, like I'll give word for you eating meat on this Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, it, it, and it's definitely like trying to take an account your humanity and your situation and sure sure yeah you know and again it's all about things being in right order you know what i mean that's why you know again uh i have no problem saying no and i'll I'll always say no when i when it's absolutely like there's no other way but the big thing for me and this is orthodoxy it's freedom trying with God's help to get people to um, move out of a kind of inward disposition, right? Like getting someone to a point where it can be like, you know, I could do this, but I don't don't want to. I'm gonna gonna tough it out a little bit today. You know what I mean? Because I know that God's gonna bless me. That's, I'm always trying to like, you know, give people the space where they're, they can, they're inching more and more to that, right? Because that's where the grace is, right? Because um, it's not just in, like, I don't want to just kind of like, and I, I get it, I, I get it. I, I like to cover it to help people or whatever, because God's merciful. Like, look, the demons don't eat, right? So it's not like, sure. it's not like God's like, oh my gosh, you know, cheeseburger or whatever. But like, uh, I mean, you know, I have some spiritual children, I'll tell you, it's like, you know, I'm going to scandalize some people. There's some people where I'll, I'll tell them to eat a piece of cheese on a fast day. That's not an uncommon thing because I'm like, oh, you're, you're getting too pharisaical on this. Let's, let's choosing, the, choosing the lesser sin over the greater sin. Yeah. Or, or, or allowing that little kind of like, that's, that's a real vaccine. That's like a spiritual vaccine. I'm introducing just a little bit of something to help for a bigger inoculation if that makes sense so so i actually think that this might be the question that we should end on unless there's a particular saint you guys are really dying to get to which is totally fine like but I, did you ask your question what yeah oh, okay yeah. yeah no we're good we're good catch up catch up um uh i i wanted to ask what would you give back to confession what would you tell someone 
um, generally who is confessing the same sin over and over and over. You could have a whole show just dedicated to confession. Um, That's not the worst idea. Yeah. So um, I would say to them, I'm so glad to see it. I'm so glad to see it. You, if you're confessing the same thing over and over again, thanks be to God, because it means that um, real kind of work is happening in that area. You know. Um, cool. Yeah, people who are like, like I actually a red flag for me would be, let's say, um, let's say I have someone like recently in the flock. Now there's, you know, that first year, let's say that's being generous, right? If they're, if they're kind of consistent. That first year is like kind of getting to know them and really kind of getting dialed in, right? But then like within that first year, like eight months to getting to two years, if it's all of a sudden they're like all over the place, right? I'm like, mm, that would be like a little bit of a red flag for me, you know? Um, and be a red flag for a couple of different reasons, but like the the thing that I want to, that I'm looking for as a spiritual father confessor is I'm looking for some focus, right? I'm looking for them to really have a focus to where they're actually going to be able to pinpoint and make like drill a hole, if you will, right? Because if they're skidding around everywhere, it can be very problematic, right? And there and there isn't really the um, there isn't really the kind of breaking through that needs to happen. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess the last thing I'll say is understanding um, this is not in contrast or contradiction to St. John Climacus in regards to the divine ladder, but um, in this context, I would say the spiritual life is not a linear line. Don't look at it as a ladder in this sense, right? So look at it in the sense of a spiral, you know? And if you picture a spiral, think about if we were to have a spiral, um, <laughs> if I had known this was happening, I would I have a little graphic I could pull up <laughs> um, and, and show you guys. Um, but if you think of a spiral. I'm going to pull up a spiral graphic. Yeah. Um, so if you think of a spiral and you cut that spiral and let's say um, get put a cross on top of it, right? Hold on, Father. I'm going to pull it up so people can have the visualization. Up in a new window. There we go. Oops. Open the image in a new window. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. Okay, great. So if you imagine putting a cross, like a, you know, like a plus sign cross over that spiral, right? Um, and in the center of the spiral is, is a cross, is like the crosshairs, right? But let's just say like at the top of the spiral is lust, um, at, uh, you know, three o'clock is vanity, six o'clock is greed, and what is this over here? Uh, 10 o'clock, whatever, is- um, Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nine o'clock is um laziness yeah sloth right um what you want to recognize is that as you're traveling right you're like um you're at the top there you're like oh okay you know um in fact here i don't know if i can i don't know can i send this to you super yeah of course Send it in the chat. Yeah. You guys need me to vamp for you a minute. You want to send like a file or something? You click on the little file icon. You can send it. Let me do this. It'll be worth it to everybody. They can. 
So yeah, here's what else I liked about Batman. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you give it, if you give him a, a uh, an opening, yeah, I'm gonna. There talk. will there will be Batman. <laughs> okay, here it comes. Okay, this will be worth it, everybody, because it'll. Okay. Uh... <coughs> this must be a big file. Oh, the technology of all of this. It's incredible. There it is. Okay. Got, got it. it. Yes. Okay. Sweet. That was pretty quick, actually. Right? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. No I, I totally put it in the wrong place. No Hold reproduction on. here, people. Okay. All right. Here we go. Oh, I see. I see. Perfect. All right. There we go. There you go. Let me... Uh, increase this okay got it okay so you know here's two quadrants it can be four or whatever right so we're starting here you start at pride i'm dealing with pride i think i'm better than everybody i'm judging everyone you know go to confession i give you some penance we work on it you're praying okay feel some progress that's great you're coming around you know and then boom, you enter into lust. You're like, oh, lust. I'm thinking about this person. I'm doing this and doing that. You know what I mean? I'm looking at stuff. Okay. Penance, you're working through it. Are you following me? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is you circle back around, right? Mm -hmm. Boom, you hit pride again. You're like, oh, what is going on here? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Why am I back in the same place? But see, what you're not realizing is it feels as if you're not making any progress, right? But what's happening each time you make a revolution, what's what's happening? You're getting closer to the cross. You're getting closer to the center, which is the cross. And each layer of that, there becomes a, a greater and greater understanding. I'll, like real, like real examples, right? With like um, people will actually. This is where there will be a transition. People will move. First, they become aware of vainglory. You know, they're like, oh, I just, I just, I want people to recognize me. I want people to know how smart I am and this and that. And, you know, we'll work on this for a couple of years or whatever, right? And then they start realizing, actually, like, there's some pride underneath. Because pride and vainglory aren't the same thing, right? Vainglory is primarily external. Pride is internal. Vainglory is like, I care what everyone thinks about me. Pride is, I don't give a damn what anyone thinks about me, right? Mm -hmm. First cuss word of the show. Oh, forgive me, everyone. Oh, it's okay. I just, I've been waiting, but. <laughs> of course, it's a priest, right? <laughs> right? I've been but playing. I mean it in a literal sense, everyone. Yes, yes, yes. yes. He means right? it literally. So, uh, so at any rate, so this, this reality of going deeper, it, this, is, this is good, actually. And mm -hmm. for the person struggling with it, it just feels like they're not making any progress, which is pride, by the way. But uh, ah, interesting. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, yeah, like all of a sudden you think like you're holy and like like when did you decide that you should be like free from all these things and be right. above? You? Like you know what I mean? Right. Um, depression is always pride, by the way, everybody. Hey. Uh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, but you're moving to the cross, and what I mean by the cross, it isn't just like oh, the cross is this place where like I'm dispassionate i have no mm. no that's not what that means actually that's not what that means at the center where the cross is this is where you become fully aware of your dependency on god mm -hmm. because mm. on these outer quadrants this is where people are white knuckling it this is where they want to be moralist this is where like hey i want i got to make my appearance you know some people god help them this is actually not that uncommon of a thing, especially among men, where they will sometimes, God forbid, and God help them, communion becomes more about like, they they almost will be embarrassed if people don't see them taking communion because they're like, sure. well, what will people think I'm, you know, they think that's something wrong, you know what I mean? It, it's it's Logan's me, it's these thoughts, but that's a real thing. Sure, right? sure. Because at that center is this like, you know that you need Christ you know that you're absolutely desperate for him and you do not take your eyes off it. That's that, that, that center cross is not freedom in the sense of 
not being plagued. It means the freedom that comes from complete relinquishing of this false notion that you can fix yourself. Mm. Mm. That's real freedom. Mm. That's real freedom. You know, I'm into it. Does that make sense? What I just said there? Absolutely. No, because like that, it, it, the outerness would be very dry like that's the word that came to mind is like there's not much actual like spirituality quote unquote going on there there's it's very like outward appearances like that pride aspect i i just remember this is a very visceral memory of when i was like that and i am still to an extent but like this is like my first year of you know i thought i was kind of faking it till i'm making it but no it was really just me like wanting you so second cuss word of the other show, one of my favorite is you can't save your ass and your face at the same time. That's a good one. Like, yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a really good one. Yeah. So um, then father, I'm sorry. I don't care. It's my show. I do what I want. I have one last question for you. Um, every uh, you've talked about uh, every passion has a opposite vice. Uh, no, 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 no. Envy. Right. Envy is the one that doesn't have an opposite. And I wanted to ask, because when I first had this addressed to me, I, is gratitude not the opposite of envy? Like, I, it's not because that's what the church fathers say, is that gratitude is not. Gratitude is an antidote to envy, mm. but envy cannot be converted. Mm-hmm. So it's not so much about an opposite. Envy cannot be converted. So every passion is an energy. You can't destroy energy. Generally speaking, it has to be mm-hmm, converted, mm-hmm. right? So I don't want to like angry man. I don't want to turn you into like a neutered like soy boy. Mm-hmm. I want to take that anger and 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 as the fathers say, point it in the right direction, which is against sin, against your passions, against sure. the enemy, right? Envy is the only one where there's no correlating. It's a dead end. It's a dead end. It's rottenness to the bones, as the scripture says. So gratitude mm-hmm. is like one of the key antidotes to it, but there is no like proper like use for envy. Hmm. You hmm. know why the devil fell? Envy. That's right. Hmm. Because even pride can be used, can be converted. Well, lust certainly can, because that's mm-hmm. if, if it's within a marriage, right? Like it could be converted into, mm-hmm. uh, you know, love between a not mm-hmm. not. I mean, the physical act between a husband and wife. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that converting that because, yeah, that had always that had always confused me because that was presented to me a while ago. And I was, was just like. But, yeah, the converting, I see what it is. It's not like a they just have to have an opposite like no. it, it has to be converted i got you okay transfigured trans transfigure there you go there you go okay yeah um i really like saint john chrysostom i'll just say that that that's, that's the last that's my saint i'm gonna plug he's he's always oh uh he was talking about i was reading on marriage and family and he's talking about how to raise children and he's talking about don't surround them. He's talking about like the strength of a tree. And he's talking about like, uh, you, we don't build fortresses around trees to like keep them strong, right? We, we like make sure that the tree itself is strong. And he's talking about we don't, we, as our, with our children, we shouldn't build up these like fortresses of like vanity and like worldly pleasure, and, you know, like, you know, self-esteem, quote unquote, blah, blah, blah. And he's like talking about, and I, I almost took a picture and send it to you, Father, because he it's just that St. John Chrysostom spice. I love I just it like makes my eyes roll into the back of my head when I when I read it. But he's talking about like, and when they fail, comma, and they will fail, comma, and then just keeps going. I was just like, that's the guy. That's the man. Like he's so like he's great. Yeah. He, I just like because you can almost see what he's doing. Like when he's mm-hmm. like, and they will fail, and then just keeps going. I was just like, man, and like every time I read it. It's like the same feeling I used to get when I would read like, like, like authors and they would say something clever, but like, there's this like meat and weight behind it. Cause it's like, there's authority behind it. You know, when he says it and like, as a person who likes reading and writing, 
a good sentence, a good phrase, a good thought can make my eyes like roll into the back. I was just like, oh, I love that. So that can like make or break my day. And St. John Chrysostom, if you're out there and you love good writing and you love good reading and you just like a love a well-constructed story or sentence or whatever, read St. John Chrysostom, especially on wealth and poverty. On wealth and poverty has like one of my favorite, and I'll be done after this, but one of my favorites is he's talking about the rich man and Lazarus. It's eight different sermons about the rich man and Lazarus. And um, he's talking about, like he's kind of breaking down the situation. He was talking about the rich man and he's like breaking down the situation. And then he's getting back to the rich man. He says, so anyway, here we have a rich man filling his soul with cobwebs. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. Just like, anyway, so back to the rich man, we have a man who's filling his soul with cobwebs. And I'm just like, it, I, I don't know. I just like, yeah. Anyway, so St. John Chrysostom, he is, he's the man. So uh, back to it, on back to reality. Okay, so there's a playlist out on Spotify, all the music. I'll make up a music question next time so we can actually have something to talk about uh, so I could put something new on the podcast. Uh, we are uh, still in the talks for merch. I'm not sure where we are with that. The, the Teespring is set up, but... I'll be darned if, the, if if we have people in the audience who have who have some experience with Teespring and why their site just refuses to load uh, the places that it needs to load in the design section, please reach out to me uh, if you have any thoughts on this. People who have worked with Teespring. Cyprian at RoyalPath. That's right. Dot network. Yeah. yeah. So go. yeah, Cyprian at RoyalPath. network. Reach out to me if you have a or if if by chance anyone in our audience works at Teespring. And it's going to ex explain to me why your web app is that so janky. Like such a delicious, refreshing drink. Really? Teespring. Does. Teespring. Have a Teespring. That sounds so good. 16 yeah. ounce lemon Teespring. Yeah, that sounds so good. <laughs> so, so yeah, it'll it'll be coming as soon as we get the Teespring wor worked out. We'll it'll it'll be coming. Still have not figured out who printed shirts, royal pass shirts for my two children. Um, but they are officially the first people to have Royal Path merch. So mm. whoever they are, thank you. Still haven't figured it out, but thank you. I assume you're a listener because you made merch based it off of our show. So thank you. Um, and I think that is it. We will see you, God willing, next week. And thanks for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.